Hey guys, we are going to go through this lecture one more time and a few more lectures before we actually do competencies. Um, you may be wondering why we have why you have to do this again. I think that it's because repetition is important. And there were a few people who said that they still weren't fully um, confident in their ability to put a patient on the ventilator. If you're an EMT, you may be wondering why you have to do this since EMTs um, cannot change the ventilator settings. They can um, they can set up the circuit, perform user or pre-operational checks. It's because you're limited in what you can do, but not what you can know. And you can be an asset to the paramedic in the back of an ambulance when they're putting the patient on the ventilator. Um, this will also <clears throat> help you not only, this will help you prepare for uh, your competency test because we're gonna have a pretty comprehensive uh, test at the end of this. And if you can pass this, then uh, you'll be able to pass your, your competency test. So we'll go ahead and get started. First, I want to talk about how to turn on the ventilator and perform user checks and put it on standby. Uh, this ventilator simulator here. So uh, to turn it on, you hit the power button and it does its own test. <clears throat> now, this is pretty much what your screen is going to look at when you look like when you turn on the ventilator. We have these modes preset for you, ASV, NIV, and CPR. And you pretty much won't need to use any modes other than these. Um, you'll set your gender and then the patient's height. And this is in inches on our ventilator. Then it calculates an ideal body weight for you. Uh, we'll talk about ideal body weight later. Uh, it won't let me actually perform pre-op checks uh, here, um, but every time you put a new circuit on the ventilator, you need to perform pre-op checks. The only tests that you need to do are tightness and flow sensor. You only have to do O2 cell when the ventilator prompts you to do it. Uh, and you have to reach so many hours before you do that, and you're not going to see that often, okay? Oh, to put the ventilator on standby, uh, let's say you start ventilation here, and we want to put it on standby. To put it on standby, you hit the power button and hit activate standby, and that puts it on standby. Uh, you have to go be in standby mode before you can turn the ventilator off. And to turn the ventilator off, you put it on standby, and then you hold the power button for, I think, around three seconds. The ventilator seems complicated, but it's really not that complicated, uh, especially towards the end. We'll talk about basically the only three settings you're going to need to know. But essentially, to put a patient on the ventilator, all you have to do is put the patient data, select a mode, adjust your controls, and we'll talk about what controls are, and then adjust alarm parameters. And those are basically the only steps that you have to go through to put the patient on the ventilator. There are multiple different modes of mechanical ventilation. These are traditional modes. We're not going to use these modes very often, uh, except for one pressure control mode, PCV+. Plus. But it's helpful to know what the other modes are and what they do, because um, ventilator terminology is not uniform. You may be transporting a patient from the hospital who is on one of these modes, and it, it's helpful to be familiar with that mode, and it's also helpful um, because it helps you uh, understand um, our specific ventilator too. So there are two types of modes uh, on your traditional ventilator, and these are common amongst nearly every single ventilator. You have volume control mode and pressure control modes. All that means is that the breath is either either terminated when the um, when the patient reaches a predetermined tidal volume. So in volume control modes, you set a tidal volume. In pressure control modes, uh, 
the breath is terminated when it reaches a pressure, uh, which on our vent is P control. Um, so in each of these modes, you have two, essentially two options. You can be in CMV or SIMV in volume uh, control modes, or PCV or PSIMV. The difference of these, um, these determine how the patient interacts with the ventilator. So in CMV, if the patient takes a spontaneous breath, then the ventilator fully supports that. The same with PCV. It fully supports that breath until it reaches that pressure in PCV or in a, this volume control mode, CMV. It fully supports spontaneous breath until that volume is reached. In SIMV or PSIMV, if the patient breathes spontaneously, the ventilator is not going to fully assist that breath. It's going to open up the circuit and allow air to flow through passively into the patient, but it's not going to fully support that. If you're still confused, I made this little, this little chart uh, with the modes and whether or not the breath is terminated by volume or pressure. So um, the breath is either terminated when it reaches a set pressure uh, or a set volume, and uh, the spontaneous breaths are either fully supported or they're not. So let's see what this looks like on a ventilator. So we'll go into our vent simulator. So here are the modes. And on our ventilator, we don't have DuoPAP or APRV, but we do have all of the other modes. So here's your volume control modes and pressure control modes. Let's see what a volume control mode looks like. So if we hit CMV, confirm. <coughs> now these are our controls. Uh, it's very simple. You set a tidal volume, PEEP, a uh, fraction of inspired O2, inspiratory to expiratory ratio, a rate, and a flow trigger. And if we hit confirm and start ventilation, then it has this tidal volume, which is probably a little high, but you can see what the ventilator's doing. And right here, I have the patient set to breathing spontaneously. So let's take that down a little bit so that you can only see the ventilator triggered breaths. So if we look at our expired tidal volume, it's about 324. It's not the 700 that we've set, but what the ventilator is doing is it's slowly increasing the pressure until it, uh, till it can give that tidal volume that we have set. And you can see the pressure slowly increasing. Um, but we still might not be able to reach that tidal volume um, depending on our pressure limit. Um, it will not exceed 30. It will not exceed 10 below your peak pressure. So your peak pressure is 30, and we're getting a tidal volume of 618 uh, right now. So if we wanted a high, higher tidal volume, we may have to change that alarm parameter. All right, so let me just put this in standby. There are pros and cons of each. Whether or not somebody prefers CMV or SIMV probably depends on who taught them ventilator management. Uh, it's really it's really subjective. Some people prefer CMV, some prefer SIMV. The pros to CMV is that every single breath is fully supported. So you guarantee a, a certain minute volume. Your minute volume is your respiratory rate times your tidal volume. And that's good for most patients. This, this is a common mode. It's very common in the ER, not in the ICU. Um, the reason it's not common in the ICU is because in the ICU, the goal is to get them off of the ventilator, right? If each breath is fully supported and the patient doesn't have to work for it, then over time, the respiratory muscles can atrophy and it could be harder for them to breathe spontaneously if they're used to the ventilator doing it for them. However, in our field in ER, um, you want that guaranteed tidal volume um, because in SIMV, one of the cons to that is it can cause more work for the patient. And in the pre-hospital field or in the ER, they're usually put on the ventilator because 
they their uh, their ventilation was not effective. Um, they've been struggling to breathe for a long time. Their respiratory muscles are fatigued. So usually they go on CMV uh, because they don't want the patient to have to do any work. Um, a con to CMV is that it can possibly increase the chance of breath stacking. So if every single breath is fully supported, uh, what could happen is if the patient does initiate a breath, they could initiate a breath immediately after the ventilator had delivered its predetermined um, um, breath that it gives that's timed after so many seconds, the vent says it's time to give another breath. If after that breath, the patient takes another uh, spontaneous breath, they may have not fully exhaled yet. So the ventilator could deliver that breath if it's triggered um, and it could lead to breath stacking. Um, SIMV is, it can be a good mode uh, for pre-hospital um, as long as you dial in a, another setting that we're going to, that I'm going to show you on the ventilator. Um, but the, the good thing about SIMV is uh, we were in a very, uh, we're in an environment where there are a lot of vibrations and depending on your sensitivity that you set, which your sensitivity is just how easy or hard it is for that patient to, uh, interact with the vent and tell the ventilator that it wants a breath. If your sensitivity set too low, then, uh, vibrations can trigger a breath, even if the patient didn't do it. So, in SIMV, let's change the mode from CMV to SIMV. We're still in a volume mode, uh, so the breath is terminated by a volume as opposed, as opposed to being a pressure mode when it's terminated by a pressure. Uh, so we'll confirm. Now, if you look at your controls, all of these controls are the same as in, um, as in CMV. The only difference is that you now have a pressure support. Now, what does that pressure support do? If the patient triggers a spontaneous breath, this pressure support can be added to assist with that patient in getting the breath in. So even if they're fatigued, they can still breathe spontaneously. They can still retain some work of breathing, but you can assist them with giving an added inspiratory pressure. So let's say that this patient is breathing. We'll say they're breathing. Let's just make it 20 times a minute. They have sufficient effort here to trigger the vent. You can see since they're breathing at 20 times a minute, essentially every breath uh, or most of the breaths will be triggered by the patient and not time triggered by the ventilator. Um, we're getting a high frequency alarm here because the patient's breathing kind of fast at a rate of 20 and our alarm, alarm limit for frequency is 14 so we can increase that a little bit okay because we determined that's appropriate for that patient so the ventilator is still giving that added pressure. Uh, the added pressure is giving them an expired tidal volume of 607. So look what happens if we change the pressure support to 10. Or let's go to 5. We'll exaggerate it a little bit so you can see. Now, look at the pressure. The pressure, since the patient's triggering the ventilator, um, isn't that high, or it should go down. Uh, the tidal volume is dropping too. You can see that on the uh, most of the patient triggered breaths. Let's increase the frequency. Confirm. Um, Yeah, so they're breathing about a rate of 20 times a minute. P support is five. So what it should look like is they shouldn't be getting all of this pressure. Uh, I'm not sure, oh, let's make the condition normal there. 
Um, so in a normal patient, not every breath would be uh, supported as much by the ventilator as it is in this uh, simulator. I'm not sure why it's doing that, but you can kind of see in, in some of the breaths it's not delivering as much. Okay? And you can actually go in and adjust this pressure support based on your expired tidal volume. So if, actually it's probably because this patient's uh, effort is high, so they're still able to draw in a higher, um, higher tidal volume. But if your pressure support is set too low, then you can watch your expired tidal volume. And you may be getting much less than you want them to get. So you could go in to P support and turn that up um, until you get, uh, until the, the patient doesn't appear to be working as hard when they take that spontaneous breath or until you get a good expired tidal volume. So let's put that in standby and we'll go back to our lecture. So what about pressure control modes? Are these something that we should be using? Um, most of the time, not. Not for a patient who is spontaneously breathing. The reason why, and pressure control modes aren't all that complicated. See, in PCV+, Plus, all you do is set a pressure instead of a volume. So the goal is to reach this pressure, not a tidal volume. The issue is that you have to constantly monitor your expired or exhaled tidal volume, or your VTE. Um, because if that pressure is too low, then they're not going to get a large volume. If it's too high, uh, then they could get a larger volume. And the patient's lung status is dynamic. So the lungs may be extremely stiff. If they're extremely stiff, you're going to need a higher pressure to reach that volume. If they're extremely compliant, um, you might need a lower pressure to actually reach that volume. But the compliance can change from second to second. So here's what that looks like, a pressure control mode. If we are in PCV plus, uh, every breath, we're not in PSIV, so every breath is going to be fully supported to try to reach the pressure that we set. So let's say we start with a P control of 10 at a rate of 10. We'll give it a second to register. Um, you can see your peak pressure is around 14 right now. Uh, your expired tidal volume is it may go up. Expired tidal volume is 327, 367. So see what happens if we gave the uh, if the patient had COPD. Make sure that I kept that setting. Let's make the patient effort nothing. Let's do that. And let's change the rate back down because they're taking a lot of spontaneous breaths. So in an entirely passive patient, that's what we want to see. All right, so the patient is entirely passive right now. They're getting a peak uh, inspiratory pressure of 14 uh, because we have our, actually, we have our peak control set on five and our PEEP on five. So the ventilator adds these two together. So it's giving you an inspiratory pressure of 14. If we change that to 10, um, our peak pressure should go up to 15. So they're getting a pretty good tidal volume now. And that's because of patient's lungs with COPD. Um, they're usually pretty um, compliant they're just kind of floppy, right? So they can accept a higher tidal volume. Uh, let's see what this uh, simulator does if they have ARDS. So we're simulating ARDS now. And the expired tidal volume is dropping. Because a patient with ARDS, they don't have 
a very uh, they don't have very compliant lungs. So in this patient, you would then have to increase your P control. So let's increase that from 10 to 20. And then our inspiratory pressure, our peak pressure is going to go up, and then our expired tidal volume should also go up. Um, so you can see why this wouldn't be that good of a mode to use, because you're constantly changing the peak control to try to get the tidal volume that you want uh, based on what you think the minute ventilation should be for that patient. And again, your minute ventilation is your tidal volume times your rate. So now we're going up to a tidal volume of 400. All right, so I think you get the ideal. I'm gonna go ahead and put that on standby and we'll go back to our lecture. So ventilator strategies. First, I want to cover some vent strategies using traditional modes, not, not ASV. And we're just going to focus on uh, volume control modes. We'll talk about ASV a little bit later. When using a... Um, when using the ventilator, there are a few universal vent truths that apply to... Uh, any patient, any ventilator, and honestly, uh, ventilator or BVM ventilation. Those are that um, you set your tidal volume for lung protection. Okay, so you use a lung protective tidal volume. You don't increase or decrease your tidal volume to improve uh, ventilation. You only change your tidal volume for lung protection. So if you're getting high airway pressure, then you would reduce your tidal volume. Your respiratory rate is your ventilation. So if the patient is not ventilating well, so if they are hyper or hypocarbic, high or low CO2, then you would change your rate for that. And your rate has a greater effect on ventilation than does your tidal volume. PEEP and FiO2 equal oxygenation. PEEP and FiO2 equal oxygenation. So if your patient is not oxygenating well, then you would increase your PEEP and or your FiO2. Your tidal volume is always based on ideal body weight. Um, and the tidal volume should be 6 to 8 cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight. Why not the actual body weight? Well, because if you have a patient this size and a patient this size, their lungs are the same size as long as they're the uh, same height in general. Your lungs don't get any bigger uh, if you gain weight. They stay the same size. Uh, how do you calculate ideal body weight? Uh, here is uh, a formula that you can use. It's very easy to do, or you can just use adaptive support or you can just use adaptive support ventilation or enter the patient's uh, gender and height, and it will automatically calculate the, uh, the ideal body weight for you. There are many different types of controls depending on what mode you're in. So if you are in a volume control mode, uh, instead of a pressure that you see here, you'll see a volume. If you're in a pressure mode, instead of a volume, you'll see a uh, pressure. Um, in CMV and PCV, you don't have pressure support. Uh, that's because it is only uh, in SIMV to give some, or um, PSIMV to give some added inspiratory pressure on those spontaneous breaths. So these are very similar. Let's talk some about vent strategies using a tradition using traditional modes of ventilation, uh, such as CM, CMV. Uh, what should you What do you think your rate should be for a patient with ARD, CHF, or pneumonia? Someone who has an oxygenation problem. Well, the rate should be sixteen to eighteen. Um, generally, we're used to giving patients a rate of about 12 a minute. That is not appropriate for patients with oxygenation problems. Uh, and it's really not appropriate for most patients because to maintain eucapnia or normal CO2, patients don't breathe at a rate of 12 unless they're really asleep. Um, 
we need a rate of about 16 to 18. Your tidal volume should always be 6 to 8 cc's per kilogram, and your inspiratory to expiratory ratio should be 1 to 2, which is normal. Note that it says, if not obstructive pathology, we're not worried about the expiratory time. And what your I to E ratio is, is your inspiratory to expiratory. Normal is you give them uh, about one second to get the breath in, about two seconds to exhale. If it was a COPD patient, we would want that uh, I to E ratio to be longer on the expiratory side to give them more time to exhale. Your PEEP and uh, oxygen or FiO2, well, that really depends and it can vary. So the folks from ARDSNET did this big study and this study found that if you used lower tidal volumes um, and higher PEEP values, then the patients did better. Okay, so there are two uh, PEEP and FIO2 tables here. Um, I would recommend using the lower PEEP, higher FIO2, mostly because a lot of people get uncomfortable when they start reaching uh, higher PEEP levels, even though uh, it's extremely safe and a lot of people want to say well if I have high PEEP then the patient's blood pressure could get lower because the theory is that high PEEP uh, increases intrathoracic pressure and decreases venous return. That is possible if their volume status is already marginal or their blood pressure is marginal but in most patients it's not going to have a significant or clinically relevant effect on the blood pressure. Uh, if their blood pressure is low or their peri arrest, then I would refrain from giving extremely high uh, levels of PEEP. So this PEEP uh, table uh, starts at five of PEEP and pretty much every patient can get about five of PEEP. And then you gradually increase both in tandem until you reach your SpO2 target. Uh, for most patients, you want it above 94%. So let's see what this looks like using CMV, um, using a ARD strategy. So let's change our mode to CMV, confirm. So the ventilator, let me just show you this. The ventilator, depending on the input or the patient's data, uh, it's not giving us that here, but it will in... Um, in our ventilators, you can see the uh, the height and the gender that you put in for that patient. So I'm just making sure I have a active patient. So if this patient has ARDS, we're going to use lung protective tidal volume, which would be six to eight cc's per kilogram based on their ideal body weight. We'll start at a PEEP of five, and we'll start at a tidal volume, uh, a lower tidal volume. Um, or a low, lower FIO2. Now, if the patient was ex extremely hypoxic, if their SpO2 was extremely low before you put them on the ventilator, um, then you could start off with, an higher, with a higher FIO2 and 5 of PEEP and titrate this down, titrate your FIO2 down, and increase your PEEP so that you're not given so much oxygen. What would happen if they were on 100% of oxygen? If, if we just put every patient on 100% of oxygen. Well, if their, uh, if their SpO2 is above 99 or 100%, then that's not necessarily a good thing because uh, their SpO2 could be 100%, but their actual uh, arterial oxygen content could be 200 or 300. And hyperox hyperoxia is bad. It increases free radicals. Uh, it actually constricts uh, coronary or uh, yeah coronary artery, so it can decrease perfusion to the myocardium. Um, so just keep that in mind that we don't want everybody to have an oxygen saturation of a hundred percent. That is not our target. So we'll go into controls, make sure our rate is enough to maintain a normal CO2 for an ARDS patient. And our I to E is 1 to 2. Okay. And this flow trigger is just how easy or difficult it is for the patient to trigger the ventilator. If we brought this all the way down, 
then the patient could trigger the ventilator just by sighing or vibrations in the ambulance could trigger it. We don't want that. On the Hamilton ventilator, five is a pretty good uh, starting place. Okay, I'll put this in standby. Now what about event strategy for a COPD or asthmatic obstructed patient? What's wrong with them? Well, they have a hard time getting air out. They can get it in, but they can't get it out. And because of that, we want a lower rate. The lower rate gives them longer exhalation time. Um, that rate can be 12 to 14. We're not as concerned with their CO2 being a little higher than normal because it's probably uh, higher at baseline. And it's more important that they exhale than it is for their CO2 to be normal because if they don't fully exhale, then we could stack breaths on top of each other. Tidal volume in every patient is 6 to 8 cc's per kg of ideal body weight. I to E. 1 to 3 or 1 to 4. When we bring the respiratory rate down, that's going to automatically uh, increase our I to E ratio. And I'll show you what that looks like. A PEEP of 5 is pretty much appropriate in nearly every single patient. Um, with the COPD or asthma patient, you probably don't want or need much of a higher PEEP than that. But 5 is good for essentially every patient. Uh, even the COPD or asthmatic, we don't want to make it too difficult for them to exhale by add, adding a lot of PEEP. But if we add some PEEP, then we can help improve laminar flow, keep those airways uh, splinted open a little bit so that they can get that breath out. And oxygen is essentially going to be titrated to whatever the patient needs. So we'll take a look at uh, what what these settings or controls would look like in CMV for an asthmatic patient. So we're going to make sure that we have the right gender and the right height and we'll uh, change the mode. We're in ASV now. We'll change the mode to CMV and confirm. We want our rate to be about 12 to 14. Uh, tidal volume is probably a little high. I don't remember what we put the height in because uh, it's in centimeters. Um, I to E, uh, if you look here, it's one to two, right? So we want that to be longer. And just by having a rate of, actually, let me make that 12. Just by having a rate of 12, our expiratory time is still pretty long. But we can change this ratio um, Actually, we want to go the other way with it. It's okay to have a quick breath in, like of one second, but we want a longer exhalation time of around four seconds. And again, our FIL2, we would titrate. Easy enough. What about for the patient with severe sepsis, DKA, or acidotis, acidosis? Imagine or think about what patients with DKA do when their blood sugar is extremely elevated. They have this sort of respiration uh, uh, pattern that we refer to as Kussmaul's breathing. So it's this quick and rapid uh, type of and deep uh, type of breathing pattern. Uh, and the rates can be pretty high from 30 to 40 or higher. So we want to basically maintain that hyperventilation. It's not uncommon, especially in the hospital or in uh, EMS, if they can perform RSI, to have a DKA patient with an altered level of consciousness who's breathing at a rate of 30 or 40, and they think that they need to paralyze and intubate that patient Um to control or protect their airway. And what happens generally is the patient's uh, compensating for the metabolic acidosis by blowing off CO2. They're paralyzed, so the respiratory compensation is removed, and then their um, arterial pH was tenuous to begin with, and you increase this, uh, this acid in the blood, 
and it drops their pH more and they go into cardiac arrest. So how do we know how fast to breathe for these patients? Uh, there are a few different ways. If you knew what the patient was breathing at or the rate they were breathing at before they were uh, intubated, then you could sort of match that. Or you could put them on uh, entital CO2 before and try to match that um, that entitled CO2 that's going to be lower because they're compensating. Tidal volume is going to be the same for every patient. I to E, 1 to 2, but it doesn't make a whole lot of a difference in them because it's not really a lung problem. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a metabolic problem. Your FIL2, you're just going to titrate that. And PEEP, probably about 5. So... Um, I don't think that we really need to go in the ventilator. Uh, you would still just go into CMV and you would change your respiratory rate for that patient. Now, what should the mode be for a patient in cardiac arrest? Well, the mode's going to change and the controls are going to change a little bit. So the mode um, should be, make this work, mode should be PCV. Okay, and this is going to be a preset. So when you turn on the ventilator, you're going to see this. It should say CPR, and all you have to do is hit the CPR button and start ventilation after you put in the patient's height. What should the rate be? Well, what should the rate be for any patient in cardiac arrest per the AHA? 8 to 10. Um, your pressure control should be about 20. Um, and I think that that is preset also, but your rate does not. Your rate is going to default based on the patient's height after you put their, their height in inches in the ventilator. So you'll have to go in and actually change the rate down. And please do not forget to do this because hyperventilation and cardiac arrest kills. So we're using a pressure mode. We actually adapted this protocol from STAT-EVAC and after consulting with our Hamilton uh, Hamilton rep, and we're using uh, a pressure mode for cardiac arrest because uh, high tidal volumes and high rate kills patients in cardiac arrest. You can essentially do everything perfectly. You can your CPR fraction could be a hundred percent, but if you hyperventilate them and give too much volume, then uh, they they will not survive. So your I to E ratio. This says 1 to 2, but if you drop the rate down, it's going to be hard to get an I to E ratio of 1 to 2. So that's not really important. Um, you can almost ignore that PEEP of about 5. That seems a little strange. Why would you want to add PEEP in cardiac arrest? A little bit of PEEP uh, we're coming to find is actually beneficial in cardiac arrest, and it can increase or improve a cerebral blood flow if you leave the lungs a little bit filled. Uh, the lungs are like a sponge, and if they're not filled, then that blood could just settle. And if the lungs are a little bit, bit inflated, then it helps facilitate blood flow through them. Your oxygen, we're going to put that at 100% because they're in cardiac arrest. Your flow trigger, we talked a little bit about that and that's what you change to increase or decrease the sensitivity and make it harder or uh, easier for the patient to trigger the vent we're going to turn that off uh, and i think that this is preset on our vent but it's something that you need to check and make sure that the flow trigger is off because the problem is if the flow trigger is not off and it's low then uh, compressions can actually trigger the ventilator. So if you were doing CPR at a rate of 100, you could be giving 100 breaths a minute. So let's see what this looks like on the ventilator. So again, when I turn it on, uh, it's going to have a CPR function um, on the main screen. And let me pause this, and I'll turn this off and turn it back on. Hold on. Okay, so I've turned the ventilator off and I've turned it back on so that you can see uh, these presets. So we're going to have ASV, NIV, and CPR. All you have to do is hit CPR there, and it's going to have the P control at 20, the PEEP of 5, and 100% um, FIL2. Now you need to go into your control section and make sure the rate is 8 to 10, and this flow trigger 
uh, should be preset, but you're going to want to turn that all the way up. And in our ventilators, it allows it to go to off. So that's going to be all the way up to off. Put that on standby. So which mode do you choose? Um, there are a whole lot of different modes. However, our ventilators not have this one or this one. Um, but basically, you don't have to worry about that one because it's not on our vent. Uh, we're not going to be using NIVST. Our non-invasive mode of choice is just going to be NIV. That's not even on our ventilator. And we're not going to use the spontaneous mode. And out of all of these other modes, we're only going to use PCV Plus for cardiac arrest, which is a preset. ASV on every single patient. So if they're in cardiac arrest and you get ROSC, you can switch them over to ASV. And we're going to be using NIV for CPAP or BiPAP. It's as simple as that. Now we're going to discuss adaptive support ventilation. Adaptive support ventilation is going to be our mode of choice for a patient on a ventilator who's not in cardiac arrest. It's the mode of choice because patients' lung dynamics change all the time. And the whole, the whole theory and the ideal behind using lung protective ventilation or a tidal volume of 6 to 8 cc's per kg is because we don't know the uh, the compliance or the resistance of the patient's lungs and we don't necessarily know how long it takes them to exhale so we use a, a low low tidal volume and uh, change the rate based on what we think the pathology is good thing about adaptive support ventilation is it measures all of those parameters for us so it measures the, measures those parameters and it adjusts the rate and volume based on the lung compliance, resistance, and how long it takes them to exhale. And it um, adjusts the rate and the volume uh, to achieve a certain minute volume. There are only, uh, there are essentially only three settings you have to worry about in adaptive support ventilation. That's a percent minute volume, a PEEP, and an FiO2. Now you're going to adjust your PEEP and FiO2 for oxygenation, and you're going to adjust your percent minute volume for ventilation. Now if you recall, your minute volume is a function of your rate and your tidal volume. So you would multiply these two together to get your actual minute volume. The initial minute volume for the patient depends on what's wrong with them. COPD and asthma patients, they can have a lower minute volume or a lower rate and tidal volume uh, because they are usually hypercapnic at baseline and we don't care about uh, having normal minute ventilation for them. If they have metabolic acidosis or a fever, uh, then they generally need um, a higher minute volume because they have a higher metabolic demand. If they have CHF or ARDS, they need a higher minute volume too because their lungs are stiff and uh, the ventilator is actually going to have to uh, decrease, the, decrease the volume because of the stiff lungs and increase the rate. For patients with a traumatic brain injury, we can start them off at 100%. Now, for currently, for most patients uh, with a traumatic brain injury, we don't routinely hyperventilate them unless they are herniating. And now we only uh, hyperventilate them to a CO2 at the lower end of normal, or that's the current recommendation. <coughs> so we can start at 100%, and then we can titrate our, uh, our percent minute volume up or down to achieve our entitled CO2 goal at a lower end of normal. And everybody else, you can just start them at 100%. Now, if the patient is completely passive, then it's very simple. All you have to do is adjust your minute volume uh, up if you want to bring the PaCO2 down. So increasing your minute volume will increase your respiratory rate and or your tidal volume depending on the lungs mechanic the lung mechanics uh, if the PaCO2 is low if you reduce 
your minute volume, then it's going to bring that PaCO2 up or your entitled CO2 up. Let's see what ASV looks like. So again, it's going to be a preset in here, um, but since I'm already in the ventilator, we select ASV, confirm, make sure the patient's height is correct. Uh, all we have is our flow trigger, which we've already discussed this, that five is pretty good for most patients. Um, FIL2 is going to depend. We can use our FIL2 and PEEP chart here. Um, and then we're going to adjust our minute volume. So if they have a COPD, then we're going to bring that down. If they have a sepsis, DKA, a fever, or metabolic acidosis, we're going to want to increase that. Uh, and then for most other patients, it could be just 100. So let's see what this... Actually, we're going to look at this here in a minute. So let me put this on standby so that it does not alarm. And let's talk about ASV alarms. Your, you have your pressure alarm here, and that is a, a peak pressure of 40 is generally the highest pressure that you want the patient's lungs to get to. So we generally leave that at 40. Your PASV limit is what the ventilator takes uh, the pressure up to uh, before it stops delivering the breath and your peak pressure limit here depending on what you set that on is if it goes above the PSV limit of 30 then it will open the exhalation valve at 40 it's going to stop delivering the breath at 30 but if it reaches 40 it's going to open the uh, exhalation valve and allow the patient to expire to protect the lungs from high airway pressures. On the graph, your uh, peak pressure line limit is in red there, and your PASV uh, limit is that dotted line. So it's 10 below. It's, your PASV limit is 10 below your peak pressure limit. Now I want to show you um, the how the two are related. So we're going to go back to ventilation. If we look at our controls, we make sure our PASV limit is 40 or 30. Then we look at our alarms, make sure our pressure limit is 40. But look what happens if we change this pressure limit up to 50. If we change that to 50 and go back and look at our PASV limit, it is 40. So now the ventilator, one minute volume alarm, let me fix that. So it's important anytime you get alarm um, to assess the alarm and change your parameters as needed as long as you have uh, interrogated the patient and the ventilator to make sure that there's nothing uh, seriously wrong. So what we've done, we went in and we changed the pressure, um, the high or the peak airway pressure alarm or the limit to 50. Why would you do this? Well, if you're getting a high airway pressure alarm, if you have this set too low, you can see it's lighting up in red because it's reaching that limit. It gives you that high pressure uh, alarm and it's flashing up here. So we realize that that is set too low and we can safely take this up to a peak airway pressure limit of 40 and that's where we want to keep most patients. But if you're reaching this pressure limit of 40 you may think well I will just go in and increase this more so the ventilator will quit alarming.
the issue with that is if I increase this, then I'm also increasing the PASV limit because the two are related. Changing one changes the other. And if we change our PASV limit to 40, it's going to allow the ventilator to deliver a breath up to 40. Okay, It's going to allow the ventilator to deliver, deliver the breath up to 40, and it won't dump that breath or open the exhalation valve until it gets up to 50. And those are dangerously high airway pressures that we want to avoid. We had a few people ask if you can use adaptive support ventilation with a supraglottic device. And I didn't really know the answer to this, but imagine if you have a patient with a supraglottic device and the ventilator depends on feedback from the patient to, uh, to operate uh, normally or to function normally. What would be the problem with using a supraglottic device? Well, the main issue is that if there's leak around that seal, if you don't have a good seal with that device, then there could be some leak, which then could give erroneous um, readings back to the ventilator, and it might not be safe for the patient. However, after consulting with Hamilton, they did say that we can use ASV with a supraglottic device, but we need to monitor the V-leak. They said it's okay to use it as long as the V-leak is less than 30. If it is higher than 30, then we're going to have to switch out of ASV and go into a pressure uh, mode like PSIV or PCV. So how do we view this on the ventilator? Well, all you have to do once you've started ventilation, you go into monitoring and you go into the monitoring value 2 and you look at your V-leak and it's 4%. So if it didn't go above 30, then it would be okay to use um, to use ASV in a patient who uh, has a supraglottic airway in place. Now, the good thing about ASV is it comes with all of these graphs that tell you why it's doing what it's doing. And these graphs can also tell you a lot about the patient's lung mechanics. So you have an ASV graph, which gives you this safety box right here. And I think that you get a lot of information from this safety box. It also has a dynamic lung graph tells you the compliance of the lungs or the resistance the resistance in the large airways. Um, so if you look here, there's this shadow, this lung shadow behind the lungs. And uh, you can compare these lung graphs to the ASV graph. So for norm normal pulmonary mechanics, this lung completely fills the box and the bronchial tree is a peach color. Um, so this is this ASV graph is telling you that it's got this wide safety box or this big almost um, rectangular safety box or square safety box. And the it's safe for the tidal volume to go anywhere in here. The tidal volume or rate combination can be anywhere from 14 up to here or from a tidal volume of 405 up to here. If you have a patient with obstructive disease, this bronchial tree turns red. The lungs actually can inflate outside of that uh, lung shadow a little bit. But look what happens to your ASV graph. So it allows a higher tidal volume because the lungs are kind of floppy. Um, they're, they're compliant, but they're more floppy than compliant. But the rate narrows. The rate narrows because it realizes, although I have compliant lungs, it takes a long time to exhale for that patient to exhale. So I need to limit the rate and give a higher breath. If you have restrictive disease, um, so if the lung is stiff, 
but um, they're stiff and not very compliant. What it does is it increases the rate and lowers the tidal volume because it senses that the compliance is very low on that patient. So we're going to go in here and look at a few different ASV graphs. So we'll start ventilation. So let's give the patient a normal set of lungs. You can see we have a, um, a square um, safety box that's allowing a high tidal volume and a wide range uh, for the respiratory. And what ASV is doing is giving you a tidal volume and a rate combination to meet 125% of the normal uh, minute expiratory minute volume. So what happens if the patient has ARDS and you have a minute volume of 125%? Uh, it takes it a few breaths to get feedback from the patient to determine the lung compliance and resistance and all that. So what it's going to eventually do is it's going to bring the safety box down, or it should if the uh, simulator wants to um, wants to be nice so it's bringing the tidal volume down we already have our uh, low tidal volume um, alarm setting to high for this patient so it's given a higher frequency and a lower tidal volume now what if they have COPD if they have COPD, it should be the opposite. It should allow larger tidal volumes um, and a lower rate. So we'll give it a few seconds to adjust and see what it does. See right now it's already starting to lower that respiratory rate and giving a larger tidal volume. It's still having the same minute volume um, that the patient should have based on a 125% minute volume. But it's just doing it by giving a larger tidal volume and a lower frequency. Put this on standby. So I also wanted to show you that uh, show you what happens to the bronchial tree if we can get that to start. So if we change this graph, so all you have to do is you can change these graphs just by clicking or by hitting that box or you can hit monitoring. Go to graphics and you go from ASV graph to dynamic lung. So if we have normal lungs uh, you can see that the shadow completely fills. The lung shadow is completely filled by the lung. And this, let me change this resistance. Let me turn it down. And you should see these red airways go away because there's not much resistance. Again, it might take a few breaths to change that. There you go. So uh, there's not much resistance in the bronchioles. So it's got that um, that red um, line has disappeared, and we have normal lung compliance. Now in ARDS, the lungs change shape to a four-sided box, and in COPD, they're just floppy lungs. Expiratory time constant. It's another monitoring value. The expiratory time constant is one of those values that it, it's probably not that helpful to look at all of the time, but it can provide some useful information. There, there may be times when ASV um, has these strange, um, strange uh, respiratory rate and tidal volume combinations that you want to try to explain 
And if you see what you believe to be a strange respiratory rate and tidal volume combination, then look at your expiratory time constant, which is basically how long it takes that patient to exhale. So ASV takes all of these uh, inputs from the patient, um, the expiratory time constant, the compliance and resistance. So it takes all of these inputs, inputs from the uh, expiratory time constant, uh, the compliance and resistance of the lungs, and puts it in this very complicated uh, algorithm that some smart engineer came up with. And, um, and basically is what you see with your uh, rate and tidal volume combination. So look in here at your expiratory time constant. Can you give you a lot of information? If it is short, uh, you can see this one is not it, but if it's less than 0.6 seconds, uh, that's usually because of restrictive disease such as ARDS, atelactasis, or chest wall stiffness. So the lungs are stiff and that air is coming out quickly. And that's what the dynamic uh, lung graph looks like. If it's normal, 0.6 to 0.9, then you have normal compliance and resistance or a combination of decreased compliance and increased resistance. So that's what you would expect a patient to normally uh, exhale at or as far as the time goes. And that's what the normal um, lung graph looks like. If it's long, greater than um, 0.9 seconds, so it's taking a long time to exhale, uh, that's from obstructive disease such as COPD or asthma or bronchospasm. You can also see this in endotracheal tube obstruction or incorrect positioning. Uh, and you can see the expiratory time constant is long here, and that's what the dynamic lung uh, looks like. So let's look at some differences in the expiratory time constant depending on what's wrong with the patient. So we'll start ventilation. Let's first start with a normal lung, and it's going to take it a few seconds. There we go. So we'll go to monitoring, and we'll look at our expiratory time constant. That's 0.6 seconds. We said that was normal, and we have normal lungs. If the patient has ARDS, let's give it a few breaths to register, and we go into monitoring. Our expiratory time constant is shorter, just as we described earlier, because it, the lungs are stiff and it's just pushing that air right back out. Now, if they have COPD, uh, what would you expect the expiratory time constant to be? Remember, they have these big floppy lungs, but the bronchioles are constricted. After a few breaths, we should see uh, this change to red, but let's look at the expiratory time constant it is longer, so it's taking longer to exhale. So since it's taking longer to exhale, what they're doing, uh, what ASV is doing is it's decreasing the rate and increasing the volume a little bit to get a 100% expired minute volume there. Let's talk a little bit about non-invasive ventilation. Uh, non-invasive ventilation can be either CPAP or BiPAP. So to use non-invasive, we'll have NIV on the startup screen, but all you're gonna have to do is select NIV. Now, uh, I need to clarify, in one of our sessions with uh, the Hamilton rep, we recommended NIVST. And that was his recommendation, and I taught that mode. That just stands for spontaneous time. We're not going to use that because it doesn't allow you to do CPAP. So we're just going to stick with NIV, and I'm going to explain that. So in NIV, you have two settings. You have a pressure support and a PEEP. Pressure support, all that is, is your inspiratory pressure, your inspiratory positive airway pressure which means that when the patient breathes, the ventilator provides assistance during inhalation. And PEEP is your expiratory positive airway pressure, a.k.a. PEEP. That's all it is. Um, 
some hospitals use standalone uh, BiPAP units. And the standalone BiPAP units use different terminology. Instead of pressure support, they call it IPAP. Instead of PEEP, they call it EPAP. So if you're going to one of these hospitals that uses a standalone uh, BiPAP or CPAP unit, they'll call it IPAP or EPAP. Or they may just come in and say the patient's on 10 and 5. Now you need to know if they're on a standalone unit or the actual hospital ventilator to provide BiPAP. The reason is because in those units, or, or in actually on our ventilators, IPAP, or your inspiratory positive airway pressure, is a function of your pressure support plus your PEEP. So if we have pressure support at 5 and PEEP of 5, then our total inspiratory pressure is 10. So they may say the patient is on 10 and 5, and you need to ask them if that is 10 of IPAP and 5 of EPAP or 5 of pressure support and 5 of PEEP. If they say the patient's on um, 14 and 7, that may mean that you have to set a pressure support of 7 and a PEEP of 7 because your total inspiratory pressure would still be 14. So how do we adjust the settings for BiPAP? Well, we'll generally start at an inspiratory pressure of 5 and an expiratory pressure of 5 to give us 10 over 5, or 10 inspiratory and 5 expiratory. Then we'll titrate the inspiratory pressure in very small uh, centimeters of water in two um, intervals of two at a time to achieve improved work of breathing. So if they're on five of pressure support, we'll go up by two to seven of pressure support. Um, then we titrate PEEP uh, in small intervals of two to maintain to maintain an SpO2 greater than 92%. Um, so which patients do you use CPAP on and which do you use BiPAP? Generally, BiPAP is more comfortable for most patients. And I think it would be appropriate to just use BiPAP on everyone. But BiPAP is good because it gives an inspiratory pressure. Some patients don't necessarily need an inspiratory pressure. If they have COPD or asthma and they're fatigued, then they just may need an inspiratory pressure. But if they have CHF or pulmonary edema, then they're probably moving air in or out just fine. They may still be fatigued, but what they really need is PEEP. So if you uh, were uncomfortable with the BiPAP settings, you could just put them on CPAP. Um, but most patients, uh, if you start them off on BiPAP with a total of 10 inspiratory or 5 pressure support and 5 of PEEP, then, um, then that's a good place to start. And then you would follow uh, this, uh, this little algorithm that's going to be in your protocols right here. Your inspiratory pressure should always be greater than or equal to PEEP. Uh, you shouldn't have a P support of 4 and a PEEP of 5. So let's see what this looks like on the ventilator. So I'm just going to select NIV, confirm. Um, I'm going to have to give the patient a spontaneous breath or else uh, it'll go into backup mode and I'll show you that in a minute. We'll give them a little bit of effort to trigger it. So we're going to go into, let's give them a normal condition. We're going to go to NIV confirm. So again, we're going to start off with a pressure support of 5, which gives us a total inspiratory pressure of 5 and a PEEP of 5. Um, and we'll confirm that. Start ventilation. So you can see the patient's taking a spontaneous breath, and what the ventilator should start doing is slowly increasing that pressure to get up to a total pressure of 10. Or close to a total pressure of 10. So if the patient was having trouble breathing, uh, but they were oxygenating well, we would increase this just a little bit. And then reevaluate. You see they're getting more pressure here. If they weren't oxygenating well, 
uh, and we had them on 100% oxygen, we would expect their SpO2 to be above 92%. If they still weren't oxygenating well, then we would increase the PEEP just a little bit, but we would never want to try to increase the PEEP above pressure support. And what if we wanted CPAP? If we determined the patient was moving air just fine, but they needed PEEP, well, all you have to do is turn your pressure support to zero. Now all you have is PEEP, which on a ventilator is CPAP. Ventilator emergencies, or how to handle ventilator emergencies, cannot be understated. Patients die on ventilators as a result of not appreciating um, that the ventilator could uh, be causing the patient to become unstable uh, or because they did not properly respond or address ventilator alarms. So anytime of an alarm or the, anytime the ventilator alarms, it should be considered an emergency. What is our mnemonic we use for a patient who's intubated who starts becoming unstable? We use DOPE. The D stands for displaced tube or circuit. Um, and the ventilator is going to alarm if this happens. O stands for obstruction. So if you get high pressure alarms or low volume alarms, you should suction or consider bronchospasm. Even though the patient's on a ventilator, we still haven't fixed what was the underlying problem. We have relieved some of the ventilation issues or oxygenation issues, but they still have the underlying pathology that we have to treat. Always consider a pneumothorax. So you check the patient, look for high airway pressures or low expired minute volume. So listen to breath sounds and equipment failure. This is not all that uncommon. So make sure you're connected to oxygen. The oxygen is running. Make sure you're not out of oxygen. Monitor your exhaled tidal volume and always, always, always ensure that you have entitled CO2. Entitled CO2 should be the first thing that goes on every single tube, every single time. If you think you have equipment failure, the first thing you should do is consider disconnecting a patient from the ventilator and ventilating with a BVM. In fact, anytime you have a patient who was doing well on uh, the ventilator or with BVM ventilation and you put them on your mechanical ventilator and they start becoming unstable, what is the very first thing you should do? take them off of your ventilator and ventilate with a BVM. This is a very simple solution, but it's one that is commonly overlooked because the patient can become, can start crashing and people want to try to troubleshoot the ventilator thinking that that will fix it. What taking them, what disconnecting them from the ventilator achieves is if they were breath stacking, if the ventilator is delivering breaths on top of breaths on top of breaths, and you had this high pressure within the chest, you could uh, decrease the venous return. That could cause the patient to become unstable. Disconnecting them from the ventilator fixes that. You may disconnect them and have this huge rush of air that comes out and the vital signs could normalize. Um, also, you when you put them on a BVM and you squeeze that bag, you actually can feel the resistance and you know what's happening. But you also have to be aware that if you've had them on high levels of PEEP before uh, or when they were on the ventilator and if they required those high levels to actually oxygenate, then you're going to have to use PEEP because PEEP recruits alveoli. And if it took a while for all of those alveoli to get recruited with that PEEP, once you disconnect them, you're going to lose that recruitment, and those alveoli can collapse again. When you hear an alarm, you should um, you should always respond to it as if it is an emergency. These are just a few common alarms that I want to go over, and you're going to have an LMS module on alarm specifically. When you get a high peak pressure alarm, 
check your entitle CO2. Make sure that you have a good waveform and look for kinking of the ET tube. Make sure the tube is patent. You can pass a suction catheter down it and just make sure that it passes easily without any resistance. Lower your tidal volume. Uh, one of the most common causes of a high peak pressure alarm is a high tidal volume. Now this says you want to monitor your plateau pressure and lower your tidal volume until your plateau pressure is less than 30. Let me show you how you can measure plateau pressure or where you measure that at. So if you're in a volume control mode, go into monitoring, look at monitoring window 3. Now you may or may not get a plateau pressure reading. Um, high peak airway pressures are not as serious or as concerning as high plateau pressures. Plateau pressures above 30 are dangerous. The plateau pressure is the pressure in the smaller airways. The peak airway pressure is the pressure in the larger airways. So when we monitor our plateau pressure, if that is high, if it is 25 or 30, we would lower the tidal volume. But again, um, you shouldn't be really in this mode. You're going to be in ASV. Even in ASV, you can still monitor your plateau pressures. But since, um, since this is a pressure mode, it's only going to allow a uh, high your plateau won't be higher than your peak pressure okay your plateau will not uh, get that high so this is important to look at just to make sure that you don't have high airway pressures on every patient and it would also be important to document it that you, you can say I have a p-plat of less than 30 or I have a p-plat of 18 just to prove or to demonstrate that you uh, the patient's lungs were protective and weren't exposed to high plateau pressures. So if you have high peak airway pressures, um, you should still consider atelact atelactasis, pneumonia or ARDS, i.e. stiff lungs, if they're wheezing, use bronchodilators if necessary, and always, always, always check for a pneumothorax. If you have a low peak pressure alarm, check and make sure that nothing is disconnected. Troubleshoot your equipment. Make sure that you still have entitled CO2. Um, your ET2 cup might have come deflated, so check your pilot balloon. Squeeze it and make sure that it's still inflated. Or if the patient inhales, then you could have low peak pressures. If you have a high minute volume, so if your respiratory rate and your tidal volume um, is fast enough to go above your set alarm limits for your minute volume, you'll get this high minute volume alarm. So make sure that the tidal volume and the respiratory rate is adequate. If your patient is starting to wake up from sedation, they can become extremely anxious and that will increase their respiratory rate, which would So if you see the patient taking spontaneous breaths, you should make sure that they have adequate sedation. And I want to show you real quick all of the places that on this uh, ventilator that will show you the patient is taking a spontaneous breath. So let's increase the rate a little bit. We're going to increase the rate above the, uh, the set rate. So you can see these pink uh, triangles here. You'll see those anytime the patient takes a spontaneous breath. You'll see this anytime um, the ventilator is triggered by the patient or if you have the sense or the flow trigger, which is the sensitivity, too low. Uh, sometimes if you move the patient, then you could see uh, this trigger. Also, if you go into your graphics and go to dynamic lung when the patient takes a spontaneous breath, you should see a diaphragm down here. It's not showing it on this simulator, but you will see a diaphragm come up. A ventilator alarm is a code blue. Anytime a ventilator alarms, everyone should take this seriously.
a lot of patients have died because nurses or physicians or RTs in the ER got what is referred to as alarm fatigue. They're used to hearing alarms and nobody thinks about it. Nobody says anything. And this has contributed to quite a few patients' deaths. So anytime you hear an alarm, yell out. You can yell, code blue, I have a code blue. Or you can just tell somebody quickly so that you can troubleshoot the ventilator uh, look at the alarm parameters, look at your airway pressures, and check your patient and make sure their vitals are stable. And that's all for this session. Uh, after this, you will watch a, uh, a few other ventilator videos. Uh, and if you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Bye.